We're filing in. Okay. Welcome everyone that's coming in. We're going about to get started. We'll take a few minutes here to uh, get let everyone get settled, get used to Zoom. I'm sure you're used to Zoom by now. Um, you won't be able to see you. And apparently you won't see anyone but me and Jackie's screen now. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the way tonight is going. Um, welcome, welcome. I'm going to get us on Facebook over here. Get that going. Okay, do that. get that going so the people who can't get in on Zoom can get in on Facebook. It says it's preparing. Ooh, it's getting a little slow. It's getting there. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I'm hoping that is go oh, title. Welcome everyone. If you aren't comfortable, we as if you aren't familiar with Zoom, you're gonna have some things on the bottom where you have a chat function and you have Q and A where you can put your questions or if you're having some technical problems. Get started in a few minutes when I get this going. We go live. All right. And as I said, we're having some technical problems. You're only seeing me. I can't get the video to work for everyone else, but you also can see her screen, hopefully. And you'll be able to hear her. Um, let's see what time is it? It's about 7.03. We'll give another minute for people to get logged in. We're at 86 right now. Go. iPhone ringing, of course. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone me, for coming. There was a thing on the chat here from uh, Rosemary. Are we all muted? So yes, yes, everyone is okay. muted, and you don't have a thing. But you can, if you need to talk to us, you can talk in the chat, or the Q and A should be available for you. So, so if you have technical problems, I would put it in the chat so I can like address it. And if you have questions, um, I like to do the whole presentation and then we'll do question and answers at the end. And I will be taking questions off of Facebook as well. I'm gonna to try to keep an eye on Facebook and get questions there if you are watching on Facebook. Um, all right, and I'm gonna get started. Uh, welcome everyone to Master Gardener Presents. We're doing, we're here with Jackie Johnson today who's gonna to be talking about herbs, um, which is really exciting. It's one of my favorite things to grow. Um, and we're also here with Tom Wenzel, who's planned this. Um, this is uh, not a new the Master Gardens Presents. We've been doing this. I don't know how many years you've been doing this, Tom. <laughs> well, I started in Appleton in 2009, and we brought in the Kimberly Little Shoot Library in 2015. So yeah. I've, I've been at it for a while. So this is the second year we're doing it virtual because of COVID. And this year, Appleton is also doing theirs as well. So we have twice the, the programming for you. So, um, and I, you will be getting a full list tomorrow for attendees. And if you want a full list of all of the programs, you can look on the Outagamie County Master Gardeners website, or you can email me and I can send that to you. So um, I think we're ready to get started, Jackie, and hearing about herbs. Okay, as, uh, as Jill said, save your questions or type them up and she'll, we'll do them at the end. And if we go over a little bit, it's okay with me It's okay, if it's okay with you. So tonight we're gonna talk about using herbs in the kitchen. And as I was saying to Jill and, and Tom earlier, I've been doing this for so long, I really don't differentiate herbs that are, are used in the kitchen and medicinal ones. So some of this is gonna spill over, but it's, I focused mostly on what you can do with them in the kitchen. 
Okay, and I do have, I, I like this one um, that we shouldn't, because I may say something medicinal, it shouldn't be construed as um, diagnosis or advice. And this little guy is saying, what herb should I drink to help me sleep? And the other guy is, says, that depends on whether you want to wake up again. And I know that's funny, but it also, think about these, we're working with plants, please know what you're doing when you're doing it, especially those of you who go foraging, there's a lot of poison lookalikes and we'll talk about the parts of the plant matter a lot when we start using herbs. Let's see, move one. There we go. Okay, this is, I have to start here. To a botanist, an herb is a non-woody plant that dies back to the ground in the winter. That means that lavender doesn't count, rosemary doesn't count, and all the spices don't count. So as an herbalist, we consider non-ornamental plants of use to man. So that's most of them. We consider spices, herbs, and a lot more plant, a lot of foods that we cons you consider just a food, like cayenne pepper. To me, that's an herb. So just so when you see this in the presentation, you'll know that I'm thinking a little bit differently than a botanist would. Okay, the easiest way to use herbs is to eat them. Okay, and how do we do that? Um, we can use them in all different kinds of things. Marinades, um, vinegars, beverages, pestos, pastas, salts, extracts, and just as flavorings. We've all used, you know, you probably all have a spice cabinet or rack and you just pull out what you need for what you need it for and use it. We're gonna go into some of these in a little more detail. Okay, butters. These are real easy to do and they're good for beginners if you haven't ever done it. You can use them on rolls and scones and meats and anything where you use butter, breads are good. And all you do is soften your butter. I, I prefer not to nuke it, but I have. And then put in your um, crushed up herbs, or even if you're using powdered herbs, you can add that. If your butter isn't quite soft enough, add, add a little olive oil, that helps. And these are some suggestions that I use. I use dill cut up, scallion cut up, and uh, lemon juice. And sometimes I'll even put a little of the zest in, and it's really good with fish. And this is my favorite one for scones, is I take a little bit of orange zest, maybe a couple teaspoons or and some ginger cut up real fine and some honey and I mix it with butter and everyone I've ever given it to just loves it. And these are on a handout, the recipes are, so you don't have to scribble down madly if you like one of these. Okay, vinegars are one of my favorite things. In fact, last week I found a new vinegar recipe. I'd never even heard of it before for maple syrup or the sap. So I've got it and we're gonna do it this week because we tapped our trees and it looks like today was the last day for it. But um, when you're doing vinegars, use a good vinegar, your favorite vinegar. I use apple cider vinegar a lot because again, mine are both um, culinary and medicinal plants. I like balsamic. Apple cider vinegar, if you're going to use it, use Bragg's, but Walmart has one for about $2 cheaper that's also organic and also has the mother in it. And it's, it, I can't really tell the difference. Bragg's probably makes it for them. Balsamic, we were in one of those vinegar and oil shops a couple years ago, and they had a chocolate coffee one. And I taste it and I go, oh, this is really good. I can do this. And I'm not going to spend $20 on the bottle of it. And it was a vinegar. So I came home and I bought their $20 bottle of balsamic vinegar. And then I started experimenting and I came up with two thirds of cocoa nibs and one third coffee beans. And you put that in the balsamic and you just let it sit. Let it sit for a week and taste it, then another week and taste it as you would any vinegar because sometimes um, they get strong. And it, the, the two thirds to one third is a ratio. Like if you've got a, you're using a cup of balsamic vinegar, then start with maybe a quarter of a cup of your, your nibs and beans. And this one's really good drizzled on meats. I love it with beef. But my girlfriend took some home with her and she used it on fruits and she liked it there too. But you can use them, the vinegars on salad dressing, marinades, and we'll talk about that too, in a bath, on fruits, veggies, eggs, french fries, balsamic vinegar and with some, uh, some different things in it are really good on french fries. We can all pretend we're British and on meats. Okay, fire cider, if you read your newsletter, I wrote um, an article a couple, I think it was the one before last because the last one was foraging. And I put fire cider in there. And this is one that a lot of herbalists will do in the fall. I always do. 
and it has horse, horseradish, onion, a lot of garlic, but not too much, cayenne pepper, lemon ginger, and it goes in apple cider vinegar. And you let it sit for about six weeks. Sometimes if you can't wait, you can do, do it in four, taste it, just strain it and use it, put it in. Once you strain any kind of a, an herbal preparation and you're gonna save it, put it in another sterilized bottle. This one is really good. You can take it with honey and some water and drink it. You can use it as a tonic. You can, I use it as a salad dressing. To me, that's great. Um, sometimes I'll put a couple of tablespoons in a stew and it's really good for a marinade. And this is how you do it just in case um, you didn't, I didn't put all of it in the newsletter. You'd fill your jar uh, three quarters full, not, not tight. You want holes and you know, you don't, want to pack it. You just want the stuff loose in there. If you're using fresh, a quarter, if you're using dried, and then pour vinegar up to the top, whatever your favorite vinegar is. I prefer using the plastic caps because the, the metal ones will rust. But if you put a piece of cellophane or something over your bottle and then or your jar and then screw it on, it's just fine. Um, some ideas for that are garlic, lemon, dill, and apple cider for fish again. Uh, we don't use the big white gallons of white vinegar for food mostly. That's for cleaning and other purposes, but there's white wine vinegar if you like white vinegar. A five flower vinegar, I haven't made this, but my girlfriend in Seymour makes it all the time. And she, she makes meat out of white five flower vinegar. She just goes around the yard, finds, finds five edible flowers, puts them in vinegar and lets them Wait, and it's very good. She's brought it to some herb meetings and we all like it real well. Elder flowers in white wine vinegar is another thing. I don't know if any of you eat elder flowers, but they're excellent. They make, if you go to the fair and you have a funnel cake, elder flowers dipped in pancake batter and deep fried is better than the best funnel cake you've ever had. But it's also good in white wine vinegar. Okay, marinades, um, tenderize and flavor meats. You can use wine in them, use vinegar, citrus, juices, soy sauces and herbs, combination of a bunch of these, Monarda or Bee Balm, the, the purple one or the red one. The red one tastes better than the purple one or the lavender colored one. The lavender colored one is more medicinal. Both of them, you can interchange them if you like. But if you put the, uh, the Monarda flowers in, and you can use the leaves in this too, an apple cider vinegar or a white wine vinegar, it's especially good for wild game. So if you have someone in the family who doesn't like that gamey taste, this will take some of it out. Fire cider is also an excellent marinade, as I said. And here is some Ideas Bay Lovage, which is a very tall plant that tastes a lot like celery. Juniper berries, garlic, pepper, in red wine for beef, so that's a really good marinade. There's also rubs that use similar things. You crush those up though before you use them. Okay, pesto, that's one of my favorite ways to use basil, but it's not just for basil anymore. This is the basic recipe and it's on your handout. It's three quarters of a cup of olive oil, three cups of fresh basil and three cloves of garlic. If you like, I put more garlic in mine because I like it a lot. Um, and I'm, those three things, I put it in the food processor and just grind them. And then I add pine nuts and then a little, and the Parmesan cheese and salt and pepper if you need it. So that's just one way to make it. These, this is another way. You don't need to just use basil. My favorite pesto of all is half basil and half arugula because it's, it's real peppery tasting, but you can use in place of the basil, spinach, cooked nettle, don't use the, the raw nettle you know, that you pick because it's got those stingers in it and it will hurt you. Dandelion leaves, mustard greens, garlic mustard. We always laugh and say, we'll get even with it by eating it. And in, case of, um, in place of the pine nuts, you can add cashews, peanuts, walnuts, sunflower seeds, just about anything you'd want. And if you don't like Parmesan for some reason, Romana or feta is our good um, choices to use instead of. Okay, if you are feeling really brave, you can try throwing just a little bit of these things in your pesto. Lavender, if you like it, I like lavender to smell it in a very few areas, but I don't like the taste of lavender, so I would never do that. Lemon balm, oregano, mint, rosemary, sage, thyme. 
and dried ones, you could try a little bit of ginger. Cayenne is interesting in it because it gives it a real zing. Cumin, celery seeds, seaweeds. Um, I make this when it's just about time to finish the harvest. I'll harvest all my basil, I grind it up and I spend the evening making pestos and then I freeze them in little containers for like a, a serving size for however many people I want. And then I freeze it and then I pull them out in the middle of winter and it's just wonderful. In fact, I'm using my last one for Easter dinner on pesto or on pasta. Okay, beverages, infusions and decoctions. For those who don't know, and you probably mostly do, an infusion is a tea, which is the fancy we call it, a, a tea, an infusion. But you take your, your flowers or your leaves, that's what goes in an infusion, and you put it in your container. And then the water that's just off a boil, you put in there. So it's the soft parts. A decoction is the roots, berries, and bark. And you put those in your container, and you put your uh, in a pan, and then you take your uh, water and add it, and you bring it all to a boil at the same time, because it's harder to get the nutrients and what you're looking the flavors out of those things if you just used boiling water over them or even half boiling water. Here's some you might want to try. Whoops, sorry. Um, lemon balm, bee balm, fennel, hops is very bitter as a, as a drink, but some people love the tea. It's, uh, it's relaxing. Uh, hibiscus, the one you eat, not just one that you picked from the uh, garden center, but make sure it's the edible one. Nettle is a, a wonderful tea. It's, it's very healthy. Chickweed, if you have skin problems, you might want to try chickweed tea. Skullcap is a native Wisconsin plant that uh, I used to think was would help mad dog bites, but that's because it calmed you down so much. Tulsi, holy basil, that is a, um, a holy plant in India. And over here, we're just in the last, I'll bet, four or five years, we've started to see it on the herb scene here, and it's absolutely wonderful. It's an adaptogen herb, and that means it goes to where you, you need it most, and it just kind of relaxes you and goes after the parts that aren't working and helps them relax. Ginger is another one. Um, you can use dried ginger for this. You can slice your, buy a big hunk of ginger and slice it up. Chamomile, obviously, is very nice. Elderberry or elderflowers, they taste differently and use them for different purposes. Uh, some of these, like the lemon balm and the chamomile, skull tap, skull cap, and Tulsi. My girlfriend is a kindergarten teacher, and when her kids were little, she used to make them popsicles out of that. And those were the best behaved, mildest children you'd ever want to see because she, they loved the popsicles and they kept them nice and calm. Okay, mustards. This is something that we, I just started doing maybe seven or eight years ago. You can grow your own mustard plants, which I don't do. I purchase the seed in bulk because when I make mustards, I don't want to make one jar of mustard. I want to make a lot of mustard and give it all away. The yellow seed is milder. The brown seed is stronger. Uh, soak your seeds if you're going to do this. Soak your seeds for about 12 hours. They'll say a few hours it's longer than that to make them soft enough so that they grind. And I use my Ninja and that works pretty well to grind them up. And then you add whatever you want in them. I make a really good um, Oktoberfest mustard with Guinness beer and horseradish and all kinds of things. It'll, it opens your eyes when you eat it. There are lots of recipes. If you want to get into your own, email me. Here is my email address, and I'll give it to you at the end. If you have any questions or anything you think of tomorrow, just email me. Give me a couple of days to answer, but I'll, I'll answer your questions then too. Okay, lemon and ginger infusion. This is something I drink nearly every day in a quart jar. I started out with, I take a lemon and chop it up and put it in there, skin and all. And um, I take about an inch of a ginger and I'd slice that, I do skin that and put it in there. And then I'd put um, hot water, boiling water, put a knife in there so you, otherwise you'll, your jar could break and it, mine did a few times until I remembered. And then you can sweeten it with whatever you want. But then one day I was watching a webinar and this lady was saying, take orange oranges and do the same thing without anything else. So I thought, well, I'll just add some orange to it. So that's what I do. But right now, when I do it, I take two jars, quart jars, and that's how much I make at a time. And I'll take a lemon and I'll slice it up very thin and I'll put half in one jar and half in the other, an orange, very thin, half in one jar, half in the other. But I still put an inch of ginger in each of them. And then 
put the hot water on and I put them in the fridge and take them to work the next day and you can sweeten it with whatever you want. There's some very good stevias out there now that are real stevias. They're not the, uh, the fake stuff, the organic ones. And that's better for, for me than, than sugar is. And I'll really push this. I might drink a couple quarts of it if I feel a cold coming on because this is just popping with vitamin C. And the ginger will help your tummy if you've got a tummy problem with your cold or whatever. Okay, cordials. This is something we got into at our, with our herb club a couple of years ago, and we just had a ball with this. Um, good thing we had breakfast. We have brunch meetings and we had breakfast and we made these things. And then we decided our brunch should be lunch too. Um, this is basically an alcoholic beverage with a high sugar content with, and you add those two things with um, an infusion of flavoring. And it doesn't matter what you use. They were originally made for medicinal purposes, right? Um, and to revive the spirit. They were documented as early as the 13th century and were very popular in France and Italy by the mid 1500s. A lot of um, priests and monasteries made these. What you need is fruits or herbs, approximately three times as many fresh as dried, obviously, because the dried are way stronger. Um, a sugar syrup to taste. I use one to one. Sometimes I'll use two to one. It depends on how sweet I'm using. Like if you're gonna use watermelon, you might want one to one part water, one part sugar. Strawberries, it depends on what you're doing, but one to one is, is pretty, pretty safe. Alcohol. Um, an 80 proof vodka is good because it allows the flavors to come out more and then they're not camouflaged by the, the brandy taste or the gin taste. Um, I found a couple of years ago, a hundred proof of the uh, spiced rum and it's the famous one with the pirate on the front. And that tastes really good when you do use it with pears or apples or cranberries or ginger. And this year I found I was, we were on our way up north and we always stop at this one shell station on Highway 32 near Mountain to, for a bathroom break. And I always feel I have to buy something to make it worth their while. So I found um, Yukon Jack, 100 proof Yukon Jack and it was flavored. It has a, an apple one and then it had fire and fire was cinnamon. So I made some cordials and some tinctures this year out of the flavored ones. And I had the best, Echinacea tincture tastes terrible, not this stuff, this tastes stuff tastes really good in cinnamon. So that's just look around, you know, I'm not a drinker. So, you know, making, sending me to the store to get alcohol is ridiculous. But the this 100 proof rum and the 100 proof Yukon Jack, especially the fire was really good. Um, some recipes say add it all together, the sugar syrup, the herb, the, uh, the alcohol, everything put in there. And others say to infuse the plant and the alcohol and then add your sugar syrup at the end of four or five weeks. I usually do it the first way. I put everything in the jar, start with the, uh, the fruit or whatever. Strawberries are really good for this, by the way. And with that, I would probably use um, a vodka because the straw you want the strawberry flavors to come out. But I put it all together and then I just let it sit. And we've, we've found them. We've made a whole bunch of them for presents and stuff. And I found one that's like two or three years old and I taste it, oh my gosh, that is really good stuff. So it doesn't go bad because it's laden with booze and it's laden with sugar. So it's really good. And here's some ideas for some that we've done. Mint, lemon balm, basils, lovage, spices, fruits, citrus, any of them, they taste good. And then plums or pears or peaches, strawberries, cherries. The cherries taste a lot like cherry bounce. So, but you can do it easier here and then you can get a cute little cordial set at rummage sale because they're not popular anymore but we herbalists will bring them back okay um let's see waters a warm infusion infusion is the, the light stuff remember the flowers and the the flowers and the leaves will extract more nutrients from the plants but the cool ones extract some of them and they're more refreshing so um just add Sometimes I'll take a bottle of water, we have it in the fridge and I'll just add a couple leaves of it and let it sit overnight or a few hours and just start drinking it the next day or take it to work the next day. And here's some to try, basils, mints, chamomile, ginger, ginger's really good. Lemon balm, holy basil, which is Tulsi, bee balm, which is Menarda. 
or any of the others you like. If you like them a little savory and you like the taste of sage, put try a sage one. It's kind of, you know, don't be afraid to experiment, especially with water, because all you have to do is dump it. It's not, not that big a deal. Okay, spa waters. If you go to the fancy hotels, they always have these neat waters out. Well, we use them for our gatherings and things. And they can, you can make them in as short as 30 minutes, but a few hours or overnight is better. Um, you gotta take out, you put everything together and you let it just sit and remove the veggies, fruits or herbs about after eight hours because they can get bitter. And, but if you want, you can leave a sprig of something in there to make it look pretty. Keep them iced and you can keep adding ice as you need to. No sugar is needed. And those vessels are available everywhere now and they're not very expensive. You know, they have the spout in the middle so you can put a cup or a glass underneath it. And I have a, a cup about five years ago, we'd all decided we were giving them as gifts to everybody. So I have about five of them. But my favorites are the twos. You know, there's two of them in one thing. So you can have one, maybe a fruit one in one and maybe an herb one in the other. Let's see, and here are some tips for it. Slice your fruits and veggies really thin because you get more flavor, you want more surface area. So you don't, you'd rather have three tiny pieces than one big piece. Um, citrus peels will get bitter, so don't infuse them too long. Mint leaves go a long way, so be real cautious when you use mint in anything. Um, they, uh, you can ruin things if you put too much mint in. Mint is the, the exception to the rule. And wash your ingredients well, obviously, and organic in this case is better. Okay, here's some suggestions for your spa waters. Fruits, lemon, um, any other citrus, <clears throat> excuse me, berries, mango, apple, peaches, pear, kiwi, grapes, watermelon, cut it in cubes, melon in cubes. Um, grapes cut in half, I like, I like to do that anyway, but then leave a few just floating around. Um, herbs to try, the basil, the tulsi, lemon verbena, lemon balm, chamomile, the mint, be careful, sage, uh, rose petals, lemon basil, lemon thyme, ginger, violets. Violets have a very light taste that's really good. Vegetables, cucumbers, and celery. And you wouldn't think that cucumbers would be good, but cucumbers and lemon and ginger are really, really good. Okay, next is syrups and jellies, and you've probably all made these. Um, either way, you can use the, the syrups on pancakes, ice cream, scones, jellies the same way. You can use any of the fruits or herbs that you like. Some suggestions are violets for um, the, the jellies mostly, but you can make syrups out of the, the elder, that violet syrup actually is very good. And so is the elderberry. Mixture of wildflowers, ginger, tulsi, cayenne pepper. We love pepper jelly and we make it all the time. It takes a bell pepper and a couple of cayennes or habanero, something really hot, but then you serve it on a cracker with cream cheese so it lightens it out and anyone can eat it. Okay, here's an elderflower syrup mix. And I put this in there because I, I wanna talk to you a little bit about elderflowers. Um, this is, I got this from my girlfriend in Scotland and she, they make them all the time over there. Put the water and sugar and lemon juice in a pan and bring it to a, slowly bring it to a boil. You don't want a big rolling boil all at once. Then with clean flowers, let them pick your flowers when they're all open and put them on a paper towel and just let them sit there and let the critters come out because they will. And then give them a couple of shakes a little bit and you'll lose some of the petals, but that's okay, there's enough there. And then put them in with the stem out. The stem has some cyanide in it, not enough to kill you or I wouldn't be here talking to you because it's one of my favorite things. But you don't want to um, eat too much of it. So we just cook them with the stem out and it gives us something you know, to pull the flowers out with and let it sit for a, a little while, then take it off the heat, let it sit for three or four hours covered if you can possibly cover it because you don't want all the good stuff steaming out. Then strain it and rebottle it again in sterilized bottles. You can add this to sparkling water. You can add it to a light unflavored vodka or both. These are, this is just a really, really good, good thing. And you can, you can play with it a little bit too. If you wanna put some lemon zest in there, that's good. Elderberry and lemon or elderflower and lemon go very well together. Okay, now we're going to go to our saltless salt substitutes. A lot of us can't or we should cut back on our sugar and salt. 
And these are some ways to, to use this. And again, this recipe is on your handout. Two teaspoons of garlic powder, onion powder, white pepper, dry mustard, and a teaspoon of thyme and ground celery seed. Mix this together. And there, it's like the one you see in the store. If you, if you pick one of those up and read the ingredients on the back, and you'll, you'll like that one, make your own. I mean, it, it's not rocket science. You just kind of kind of play with it a little bit. Here is another one. This one is a little um, more detailed. This one is really good. It's got the onion flakes. So those are big. So, you, you know, it's not going to go in a, a salt shaker. Dill leaves, you know, that's a little bigger too. Um, let's see, three tablespoons of um, dill seeds, lightly toasted. Sorry about that. Thyme, oregano, celery, lemon peel, paprika. I don't like paprika, so I don't include that. Garlic powder and black pepper. Um, when I make this, I don't, I put maybe a pinch of oregano in because I think oregano is overpowering. But, you know, again, use what you like and what you don't like, take out. This is really good though, all this stuff together, if you put it in a cream cheese and use it as a dip. So it's not just for, um, for just a saltless mix. But if you wanted to make a salted mix, take your salt, and I use sea salt, you can get it iodine now, so you don't have to worry about goiters anymore. Um, put it on a cookie sheet and then take whatever you're gonna flavor it with. You know, if you're going to have a mint salt or a garlic salt, just sprinkle some of the, whatever you're gonna have on top of it, put it in the oven, cook it long and slow. Um, for 10 to 20 minutes, watch it so you don't burn it, but that you want the, everything dry, dry enough so it just crumbles. And this is one of the few times I'll tell you to crumble it and put it in a jar. Otherwise, just put it in the jar, let it cool completely, label and date, and then crumble it when you're going to use it. Okay, sugars. Um, you just layer the sugar and the herb, sugar, herb, sugar, herb in a jar and label and date it. Um, I put this in brownies one time when we went on one of our bus trips down to, that, I don't know, one of the places we went to south with the Master Gardeners, and I passed them around, and if you, were, if you were on the bus and you were close enough that you got one, everybody liked them. They just couldn't believe that was lavender in there, because lavender sugar is one of my favorites. Um, and when we are done with it, you come I mean, when you're it's fully infused, you can smell it and see if you, you like the smell. You can either strain it or not strain it, or I have taken it and put it in the food processor or my Ninja and zipped it into a powdered sugar, which you can use on just about anything in, in baking or on top of things. And here's some to try, lavender, lemon balm, lemon verbena, lemon zest peels, vanilla beans, uh, cinnamon sticks. Vanilla beans and sugar is really good if you're going to make shortbread. Um, cinnamon sticks or any spice of your choice, mints, rosemary, rose petals. Rosemary and sugar surprisingly go well together. So biscuits, scones with, with the two of them, if for some odd reason, or shortbread cookie, we make um, rosemary shortbread that is out of this world. Again, if you want a recipe on that one, I didn't put in there. Um, spring is nettle soup day or soup time around here. We have a nettle night every year. Of course, last year we missed it because of COVID. And we're not quite sure about this year yet. We'll have to see um, when nettle comes out. It's probably gonna be early this year because it just seems like it. But we make nettle soup, pasta and pesto. And this one's my favorite. It's called net nettle barley broth, but it's, it's really a soup. Two cups of young nettle, a cup of chicken broth, a quart of chicken broth, half a cup of barley, a cup of cubed or sliced potatoes, chopped onions or garlic is optional. I use both. And wash the nettles and chop finely and then boil with the chicken broth. I put it in, in the beginning with this and cook for an hour with the barley and then add the nettles and potatoes. I've already added my nettle. Um, cover, bring to a boil and let simmer for an hour and a half, two hours, I mean, an hour to two hours. And then it stirs four. I put in a crock pot at that point and just turn it on low and let it sit. Um, this is a, a fun recipe for people who are go, oh, nettle, oh, that burned me. I would never eat it. Nettle is probably one of the top 10 most nutritious plants in the world. And I took this up to a, a crock pot full of this up to uh, up north in Michigan one year when they were having a, an herbal fest. 
And I put it out and I said, you know, this is a metal broth if you any, any of you want to try it. And I went around and looked at all the vendors and everything. And I came back and it was gone. I didn't even have any for my lunch. So it goes well. People like it. And the, pot, the pasta, we'll get to it in just a minute. Here that is. Um, using your favorite pasta recipe, you can add plant material. We regularly use nettle. They make a green color. Beets um, make red. Dandelion flower makes yellow. Carrots make orange. And the kids love to do this. My girlfriend's kids just have a ball doing this. But experiment with your favorite veggies. Um, we like to think it's really good. We'll make our nettle pasta, but then we, we fry, uh, fry, or fry garlic and in butter and we just saturate it. So it's probably not good for us, but boy, it's good. Um, here's, I told you about the lavender brownies. You can use mint too. Again, start small and go up, you know, taste the batter because, you know, when it cooks, it's going to get stronger. So don't put three tablespoons of mint in and then you won't be able to eat it. Taste it along the way. For this one, lavender brownies, I usually put a tablespoon. I crush it up in the ninja and it's, it, it's much, much better that way, but I've used less and I've used more and I've been happy both times. Okay, this one is something not to try. Herbal oils have been used. They were very popular about 10 years ago and people were making these herbal oils and they put their oils in the herb and they'd let them sit around for six weeks in the window and then they look pretty and then they'd re-bottle re them, strain them and re-bottle them in pretty bottles. Adding fresh vegetables to oil is a recipe for botulism because it's moist and it goes in the oil. Too many people were getting sick from this. So it is not recommended you do this. Once you get in the store, stick to those because they have all kinds of preservatives and have done all kinds of things with them. If you really have one that you absolutely love and you want to have a dipping oil, make it that day, use it that day, and then throw it out, whatever's left. You know, you, you won't get botulism for just a day. But, you know, I even shy away from that, although I, I have done it. But don't just let them sit. No matter what the books say, those books are old. The new books won't say, oh, these oils are wonderful and make lovely gifts anymore. Okay, ethnic diversity. We have such diversity in our country. Each one uses herbs differently, different herbs, and there's new arrivals coming all the time and they bring all new flavors with them. And it's really, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to use different herbs. And we're all set in our same five or 10 and our same five spices we use. But when you see some of these different kinds of gardens to plant, it's fun to try different things. And here's some of the Asian herbs that, uh, that some of the people use. Uh, the Asians use a lot of Vietnamese coriander, lemongrass, shiso, which is in the mint family, lime leaf, and they have a lemon leaf too. And we tried them, a friend of mine had them a couple of years ago and we tried them and they're very good. They taste, the lemon one tasted more lemon than a lemon did, it was wonderful garlic chives, and of course, ginger for the Asian herbs. And these are just some, there's a whole lot more, but these are some of the more common ones. Okay, for Spanish herbs, rosemary, bay, oregano, basil, thyme, minced parsley. And no, these are all Mediterranean herbs because we forget that Spain is also on the Mediterranean. German herbs, um, borage, sorrel, chervil, burnet, salad burnet, lovage, sweet woodruff, which if you have ever had German sweet wine or spring wine, that's the sweet woodruff is the plant in there that makes that. Savory and European ramps. Middle Eastern cilantro, anisysop, spearmint, parsley, thyme, spices. They, all, they mix a lot of herbs and spices together and it's a flavoring we're not quite used to, but it works. And if you, if you get into Middle Eastern cooking, now, my girlfriend has cooks that way and she loves it and she brings stuff in for us to try and it's really good. Mediterranean cooking, here are some of the most common oregano, oregano, marjoram. A lot of people think marjoram is just a weaker oregano. I tend to agree. Garlic, onion, basil, rosemary. And I put pot because if you're going to grow rosemary, grow it in a pot because it's going to die here in the winter. It just can't make it. A, at least I'm in Seymour and it, I have never had one. So I always bring them in the pot or put them in a pot and then bring them in for the winter. Turmeric, cumin, thyme, and all the different sages. Okay, here's some Mexican herbs. Um, 
I won't touch cilantro. I had it in my garden once and I won't even touch it. My nephew hates it too. And I always tell him if he doesn't shape up, I'm going to fill his pillowcase with it. Um, Espizote is uh, in the lamb's quarter family, actually. So here it would probably be a weed, but it goes well in their cooking. The Mexican or Cuban oregano, that real fat leaf you can find, that's, that's really good. Thyme, lemon verbena, onion, garlic, tomatoes, and peppers. Okay, general tips. Fresh, freshly harvested are best, but bulk herbs are okay too, bulk dried herbs. Um, especially in winter, like now, we can't have anything. You can have some in pots in your house, but right about now, they're probably getting ready to die. And annuals, their lifespan is one year. So you can try your hardest to keep them alive for more than a year, and you might get a little longer, but you won't get more, much more than that. Dried herbs are stronger than fresh. So when you're using dried in recipes that call for fresh, reduce your amount accordingly, because otherwise it's going to be way too strong. I made that mistake. Um, general tips more, add herbs. If you're adding them to a stew or a soup or something, add them like a half hour to an hour before because cooking them tends to break down their oils and, and they'll taste more like what they're supposed to taste if you just add them at the end. Crush them when adding to retain their flavor. If you, you know, make all your herbs, you've dried them all nice now and, and you take them and you'll crush them into powders. The powders aren't going to have a lot of flavor for a real long time. So we always like to put them in bottles, cap them, and then as we use them, then we crush them. Um, if you're playing with recipes, don't add more than three herbs to one dish unless you know what you're doing or the recipe specifically calls for it because you can get it wrong. We've all got it wrong and they don't taste real well. And don't be afraid to substitute. I mean, if you wanna try, you set in this, this recipe and you're really good with it, but you wonder, I wonder what it would taste like with this. Taste, take a little bit out and put that other herb in and see if you like it. So then you don't spoil your whole favorite dish, but you still can get a way to do that. We did that with um, chicken in one of our herb meetings. We took, we, we fried chicken. We had all these pans set out and we put different herbs in every one of them. So we got to uh, try, I think there were eight or nine of them. We got to try just chicken, fried and different herbs and oil. And we got wonderful flavors that we would have never thought of actually. Okay, these are, whoops. These are some of the different gardens and I do have these on the handout. If you want a tea garden, lemon balm, the balm again, Monarda, and it's a native. Echinacea is a native, of course, that's not a culinary plant. Echinacea is a medicinal plant, but it still belongs in a tea garden. Ginger, this can be planted in a pot and should be. It takes about eight to nine months to, uh, to get to be big enough so you can harvest it. And you take the ginger root. If you've got one at home, look at it. It's kind of like a potato. It's got little sprouts here and there. Break that off and put it down about, I don't know, an inch or two deep in the dirt, good dirt. And then just keep it watered. It'll grow this long grassy thing out. And if you're really lucky, you'll get a white flower. But I only did that once. And then when the flower dies, dig it up. And if you planted a piece that's an inch, you're probably going to get two inches. It won't be as strong as the first one, but it's still ginger and it's very good. Just wash it good. Um, mints, again, use, um, use them sparingly. Valerian is another, it it's, belongs in a tea garden, but it's, a nat it's not native. It's from Europe, but it tastes like dirty sweat socks and echinacea tastes like mud. But there are ways to help that. And that with that um, 100 proof Yukon Jack, I did help that a lot. And mine's good now. Uh, raspberry, Tulsi, is, holy basil tea is one of my favorites right now. I have it every day. Tulsi ashwagandha every morning. And I really like it. Chamomile is our nighttime tea. We take that before we go to sleep. Okay, salad gardens. Here's some suggestions. Salad burnet, lovage, borage. French sorrel, calendula, chives, garlic chives, arugula, and lettuces. Uh, lovage is, it's an old time plant that we're trying to bring back now and it seems to be in more garden centers. It can get five or six feet tall. The leaves taste like celery They're, and it makes a wonderful soup. Lovage and potato soup is just delicious. Borage is the, the flowers taste like cucumbers. You don't wanna eat too many of them. You could get sick from if you don't eat 20 or 30 in a day, but I eat a couple every day and I'm still here to tell the story about it. But these are some of the things that I would put in a salad garden. Edible flower gardens, calendula, nasturtium, borage again, chives, 
Chives, by the way, you can put in a, a white wine vinegar and it's a very nice vinegar once it's done. It's good salad dressing and you can use it in mar uh, marinades too. Dandelion, lavender. Dandelions you can make a fritter out of. That's really good. Lavender, chamomile, coriander. Again, bee balm, monarda, dill, roses, non-hybrids. You don't want to... Um, you know, the new ones that they have are lovely and they smell wonderful and they don't have a lot of the diseases, but it's the old fashioned ones you want to eat, not these. Um, the bee balm, the Monarda, again, this is a side on, on the medicinal, but if you take the lavender one and you have an um, upper respiratory thing and you make tea out of it, it's really, really good for that. Okay, culinary gardens. Try to plant your culinary garden as close to the house as you can. That's been historically what's been done for thousands of years. Um, you can plant specific gardens. Okay, this is going to be my tea garden. This is going to be my, my headache garden. This is going to be my culinary garden. Uh, or you can just mix them all up. Uh, we use, we plant garlic between the potatoes and it cuts down on potato bugs we found. Um, some make others get a good book on companion planting because herbs between some of them, a lot of bugs are, they don't like herbs and that's a good thing about them. Some of them they do, but not most of them. Okay, favorites for the culinary gardens, rosemary, I told you in a part, pot, parsley, thyme, basil, oregano, marjoram, fennel, sage, chives, elder, just the nigra or canadensis, the rosa, the black lace, all those are not good. I think they've got Adam and York that you can buy um, from some of the online garden centers. But Nigra canadensis, canadensis of course is the North American one. The Nigra, the black one is the European one. Those are the original ones and they're to me, they're the best ones. Um, cayenne, lavender, horseradish, another one that our grandparents use, it's making a comeback. And in the next Master Gardener newsletter, I'll have an article on what to do with horseradish, but horseradish is really, really a good, good thing to grow. And it, it's not hard to grow. You just need a piece the size of your, your joint on your thumb and you'll get a lovely plant. In fact, I had a friend who had horseradish in his garden. He was just really sick of it because it was encroaching on everything else. So I said, just cut it back and call your friends and tell them to come and dig it out for you. But no, he knew better. And he took his tiller in there and he tilled it up. And I just laughed. And the next year he had more horseradish than he knew what to do with because he cut all those roots up and they all started reproducing and it was just his nightmare. Okay, cilantro, coriander, cilantro is the bottom of the plant, coriander is the, the seed of the plant from the flower, tarragon, savories, uh, summer or winter, um, fennel, dill, mince, garlic, lovage, Caraway, lemon balm, lemongrass, lemon thyme, any of the lemons or, or plants are, are good in a garden, a culinary garden. Okay, the Mediterranean herbs. Most of the common herbs in that other page are from the Mediterranean. And what happened was when the War Romans came around and they conquered their known world, it was a slow process. It's not like now where people get on planes and they land and, and things happen fast. It was a very slow process. They advanced, they took um, control of a place. They made encampments. They brought their doctors with them. The doctors built a hospital because they were there for years. Outside the hospital, they planted their medicinal herb gardens, and then they moved on in a few years. And when they moved on, the um, you, mostly it was the priests who made monastery medicinal gardens, but a lot of the common folk did too. They went and they grabbed those plants because they were used to them, both for medicinal and for culinary purposes, because they're so interchangeable. And that's how the Mediterranean plants got spread all over Europe. How they got to America was when our ancestors that came across the sea as colonists and settlers, they came to a land that they didn't know, and they didn't know what was here, and they didn't think it was going to be the same. So they took with them what was most important for their culinary plants and their medicinal plants. And a lot of those were the Mediterranean plants. And luckily they started in more or less in the South or on the coast where it's a little more temperate. If they'd have come to Wisconsin, a lot of them would have died and we wouldn't have them. But that's how a lot of the Mediterranean herbs are all over the world right now. Okay, okay herb growing basics. Um, it's just like planting anything else. They need good well-drained soil. 
herbs need um, mostly sun, partial shade. If you plant mints in the shade, they won't be as aggressive. A lot of people say put them in pots and pl plant the pot in there, but I don't. I just plant anything that I think is aggressive on the edge. So you just cut it down with the lawnmower if it starts encroaching out. Um, they need water. And research your plant to find out which are tall ones, which are the medium ones, which are the lower ones. So you can plant your garden so you don't have your real tall ones in the front casting shade on everything else. But that's what you do with, with you had if you had an ornamental garden too. Whoops. Containers, lots of them can be planted in containers. Make sure you have a very good soil, not a topsoil or something like that. But for I always look for the ones with four herbs and with some kind of a three month or whatever fertilizer. Rosemary has to be brought in before the first hard frost. They are very tricky to keep indoors. Generally, they die around February. Sometimes you can get them till March. If you get one to overwinter, you are extremely lucky. Watch your sun and watering if you have your container gardens. Um, around here, it's drought and monsoon, so some of mine don't make it. Um, some of the good ones for winter indoors are chives, thyme, mince, basil, oregano. And if you can keep rosemary alive, good for you. It's always worth a try. And if you see it starting to go and it doesn't have any disease on it, cut it down and use your rosemary up that way. Okay, let's see. Trimming your herbs. Most herbs need trimming to some point. Some of them need it a lot, like basil. Trimming will get more for you. Trimming tips, do it often, especially basil. The more you cut, the bigger it gets. Now harvest from the top, the young tender leaves with lots of flavor. The leaves at the bottom kind of leave their, their, heart, their harsher tasting. They're um, bitter, some of them. And they also need for balance. You're not making a topiary. So if you cut all the, the bottom leaves off and that leave it top heavy, it's going to tip over in one of the bad storms we have. Uh, stop trimming in August if you want them to reseed yourself. And I always tell people, start collecting seed because you never know what's going to happen the next year. So it's always a wise thing to do. Harvesting. Always use the right part of the plant and harvest that part. Never har harvest where there's any hint of chemicals. So if you're growing herbs, don't grow them where you're going to put some kind of a fertilizer on your lawn. We haven't used fertilizer around here in 25 years, I don't think. So my grass is, if it's green, it's grass. We'll live in the country. I harvest at the correct time before or after flowering. And try not to damage the aromatic oils in the plants when you're harvesting them. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. And if you're using um, these for ingestion, use only the undamaged part of the plants. You don't want something with a spot on it or it's crinkling on the edge or something or it's got bug, bug holes in it. Okay, always use sharp scissors, make a clean cut. Don't cut the leaves because they're, you wanna preserve the oil. So take them down at the base if you're gonna take a leaf. And as much fun it is, as it is to start at the bottom and zip up and take all the leaves off a plant, don't do that because that hurt, unless you're the, it's an annual and you're done for the year because this hurts the plant and diseases can get in all those holes. And handle them as little as possible because again, you're preserving that oil. Some herbalists believe only in pinching because the pinch does kind of close the wound. If you're new at this, um, harvest and, and then dry, take in and dry. And we'll, go, we'll talk about drying in just a minute. Dry your herbs and then do the next one. So you can get confused. You know, I had a lot of trouble between oregano and marjoram for years. And even the first year I was growing rosemary and lavender. I mean, these two plants are nothing alike, but I got them mixed up. But as soon as I smelled them, I knew, of course. Um, pick unblemished plants. I, I already told you that for harvest if your uses include ingestion. Okay, the parts of the plant matter a lot. Example is rhubarb. If someone told you to go and harvest rhubarb and you didn't know anything about rhubarb, who knows what you'd bring? Would you bring the stem or would you bring the leaf? If you brought the leaf, you, you know, you're going to be in trouble. So get a good book or, you know, have someone help you with that. If you know an herbalist, call them. Usually we just love to help. Okay, and these are about these oils I'm talking about. These volatile oils in the plant are produced by the plant for their protection, either to attract a pollinator or to repel an enemy. But that's what we want. We love that oil. 
We want to preserve it. That's what's good for us, both culinary, medicinal, everything else. So we try to harvest and preserve to protect that oil and get the most we can. If you have ever watched an herbalist go through a garden, we're the only ones that are the touchy ones. Ornamental gardeners will walk through and they'll ooh and ah. We walk through and we bend down and we grab something and we smell our fingers. Ooh, ooh, that's an herb, that's nice. You can always tell us in the garden. Okay, the leaves. General, most plants are best harvested before flowering because once the, they go to flower, the plant concentrates on the flower and the seeds. That's what they're, they live to reproduce. That's their one goal in life is to reproduce themselves. So the leaves aren't as tasty because all the energy is going into the other, like chives, once they're in flower, the, the rest of it doesn't taste all that good. So if you don't care about the flowers, or if you have two plants, use one for flowers and then keep the other one whacked down and, and use the, the chives because they're really good in soups and salads and things. Okay, flowers, I know this is a St. John's wort and you don't eat this, but I just love this picture because they're so bright and yellow. Anyway, generally the flowers have the highest oil in them just as the flowers are opening. So if you're looking at a culinary flower and you wanna get the most flavor out of it, just as it's opening up, grab it because that's when it'll be the best for you. Seeds, um, harvest this, I'm sorry, this is so blurry, I didn't realize that. Um, when you are ready to do seeds, just kind of flick the branch and if the seeds fall off, then you know that it's okay to harvest them at that point. I take them, bend them over, put a bag on it. I don't remember who told me to do that, but they were right. And then cut the stem and then you can hang the bag up, put some little hold, pin holes in it to let some of the moisture out and, um, and store them. But store them whole, the seeds whole, until you're gonna use them. Because again, you wanna preserve that oil. Hang them upside down like you see in all the pretty pictures. Probably takes two to four weeks depending on what, what it is, but check it. I mean, you can open the bag and check them. Okay, roots. This is ginger, this is easy, you just yank up. Horseradish is a little bit trickier as it, it goes down. If you're gonna plant horseradish, really do some tilling because it grows down. The deeper the soft soil, the better, the longer your root will be. So be very careful so you don't damage them. Usually in spring or fall because that's when their energy is highest. I usually do it in the fall. Um, wash them carefully, they've got dirt on them, cut them into small pieces. And these can take three to six weeks and, and they'll snap. That's how you know they're good and dry. If they bend nicely, that's not dried. Okay, barks. Um, best to do this when you're going to prune, collect when the sap is running, spring or fall, the same as the roots. Um, peel in thin stripes with a sharp knife. Always cut vertically. If you're doing a bark and you don't, you know, usually you don't want the end ones, you want the second branch in, but each plant is a little different. So before you go harvesting barks, do some research and find out what part of that bark is better. Um, don't ever cut vertically around because you'll girdle the tree and then it's going to die. You cut those into small pieces with scissors or a knife or whatever you have, lay them out to dry. That's, that's the best way to do them. And then again, when they, when they, crack when you take them and break and bend them, then they're dried. If they bend, they're not dried yet. Okay, annuals, you can harvest them up to frost. Um, if you, you wanna harvest periodically through the year, this is a calendula, the more you harvest, the more you get. In late fall, you can cut them right back to the ground because they're gonna die anyway. So you might as well get everything you can. Perennials, I stop harvesting in late August or mid-August actually, especially the lavender to help it survive. Usually about, they say about one month before the frost, but who knows when our frost is gonna be. I think September 17th is when it, the first one averages here, but I'm not sure. Late pruning can cause new growth on that plant and it doesn't have a chance to harden. So you're gonna kill your plant. So be real careful, careful of that. Cut down only about a quarter of a plant at the same time, that's approximate. You don't wanna take more than half, that's for sure. You, you might kill it. Okay, if you are into harvesting by the moon, a lot of people are and they will only do that. And they feel that you'll get the strongest concentrations from the plants if you follow planting them by the moon and harvesting them by the moon. Well, rule of thumb for harvesting is take the roots by the dark of the moon 
and take that aerial parts from the, the ground up on the waxing or the full moon. And believe me, your neighbors may think you're strange when you're out there harvesting in a full moon. Okay, thunderstorms, harvest just before thunderstorms, not right after a rainstorm. If you go out when we ha start having thunderstorms again, go out and look at your plants and you know one's coming because a weatherman's told you, you look at the sky, it's this nasty color. Go out and look at your plants. They are producing so much oil to protect themselves. They just look vibrant. And that's a good time to grab them for us. And you won't hurt them if you take the tops of them. Okay, drying. You wanna dry your herbs as quickly as possible um, to avoid mold and discoloration, especially mints. Mints will reabsorb moisture. So I never take my mints and try to dry them when I know in the next three days there's gonna be a storm because they'll be just about dry and the storm will come through because I like to hang them, you know, and like in the top picture there. The storm will come through and then they get damp again and then you gotta throw them out. Hot temperatures, very little moisture, good air circulation. Dehydrators are wonderful. I have three right now um, hanging in bundles, but this is my favorite way. And this was told me by a little old Nida lady who is a wonderful herbalist. She put them in a brown paper lunch bag, marked what was in it, put it in the car and parked in the sun. And darned if those things, if it's a real hot day, they are dried within a day two at the most, unless you've got something really big. Even if you take your barks and put them in there and your roots and put them in there and do all the, you know, cutting them into little pieces and putting them in a bag, mark your bags and then put them in park in the sun, don't park on a ramp and they will dry. It is absolutely amazing. I thank her almost every time I go and do it because that was such a wonderful idea. And I would have never thought of it. Okay, drying. Um, so I'm, I've probably said this enough, the herbs and spices, the smaller the pieces, the faster the oil is going to dry. So we're, I've, I've told you, hold off breaking them, crushing them until you're going to use them. Then check your spice rack and discard anything that's over a year old. Um, and buy smaller, you know, those great big ones. If you're going to use a great big one in a year, that's fine. But if you're only going to use a couple of teaspoons in a year, get those little tiny ones. That's better. And please don't go to the store and buy a spice rack with all the spices in it. You don't know what those spices are. You don't know the standards that were used to collect them, dry them and store them. So it's best just to buy the empty spice rack and then go to Hobby Lobby or somewhere like that and get some nice little bottles that'll fit in it and some nice little labels and then go get the little ones if you want and put them in, in there. And they look very nice and they taste a lot better and you will be much safer. Okay, storage. I use um, canning jars. I have mostly their quart ones that I use. Um, airtight containers, colored glass is best. And they are making them in blues. And I think they had a green. And I think maybe they have pink now too. But you can buy, if you go to rummage sales, um, you can find the old blue ones. And then I get the white plastic tops and put on them. You can't can with those anymore. A lady told me that she had a box of brand new blue jars and a, two of the packets of brand new metal things to put on the top that can, and she says, you know, you can't can with these anymore. They, it just doesn't work. I said, that's okay. Um, I wouldn't pay more than a dollar or two for them. If you go into some of these shops, they'll be eight to $10 for them. That's way too much. Look at rummage sales because some people just bring them out of their basements and they'll, they'll practically give them away. Um, plastic containers are okay, but the oil will leach into the plastic and leave the plant. And that's what you don't want. Mylar bags, I've heard they last for 20 years. I'm testing some of them on that. I've, I've had some Mylar bags from Frontier Natural Products that you know, we, I order in bulk sometimes. And I keep them in those Mylar bags and I keep them in a plastic tote. And the ones I've opened a year or two later have been just perfect. So I'm hoping those Mylar bags work because we just bought a freeze, freeze one and freeze dryer and um, we're hoping that these, these work well. Okay, now we'll be open for any questions you have. Jill, are you there? I am here, I am here. Okay. <laughs> so our questions, we have quite a few. So one came up on an um, email I got earlier that um, how do you get your basil to be full and not thin and tall? Trim it. Keep harvesting it into the shape you want it to be. Just like you were doing a, a topiary, but 
keep the bottom leaves there. Just keep trimming it and it'll get bushier and bushier. It sounds to me like it may not be getting enough sun. That could be too. Basil like sun. Yeah, leggy plant generally means not enough light. Okay, great. Um, we also have what a question in the chat. What do you use to grind up basil? Um, I have, it's like a food processor, but it's one of those things that you just touch it for like a second or two and it just grinds that long. And I put it with my oil because it works better that way. Because otherwise, well, you can try it, but it, it gets snarled. So, you know, just don't just push the button and let it go for a minute. That's not going to work. It's, you've got to do it short spurts. Okay. <clears throat> Someone said they'd like to harvest thyme, but it's hard to get the leaves without the stems. That's okay. true. That's <laughs> one where you, you'd cut the stem too, because that's another one that likes to be trimmed. Cut the stem and then dry it, and then you can and take them and zip them off the stem. All right. Where can one get Tulsi? Um, I get, I order seed every year. I got it this year from Richter's and from So True Seed or a, there was another place I found it and they had all three. There's three different kinds of Tulsi and they had all three. So I got the three package. But if you look at some of your garden, um, So True Seed, there's Prairie, but that's, does, it wasn't there. Um, strictly medicinal herbs, if they have it, I know they do, and I know Richter's does. Richter's is in Canada, but they're real good about sending their stuff right out. All right. When you use lavender, do you use the flowers or the leaves? The flowers. Okay. Although you can use the leaves too, but the flowers are the, the oh. if you're going to eat it, the flowers are the most fragrant. So you a couple leaves get in there, it's not going to kill you. It's just going to be too strong. Okay. And what is a good use for tarragon? Tarragon is one that, uh, let's see, what I don't use it that much because I don't really care for the flavor, but I've heard it put in stews and I've heard it put in saltless mixes. So you just kind of look for a recipe that, that has tarragon in it and see if it looks like something you'd eat. I've got it, I had it growing in the front and I, you know, someone gave it to me. Oh, that's wonderful. And the tarragon quite, quite big. It was like four feet tall. But when I started using it, I didn't like the flavor. So I just kind of let it go. Uh, Jody asked, does winter savory and summer savory have different flavors? Yes, they do. And one of them is an annual. I think the summer one is the annual and the winter one is the uh, perennial. They do, the winter one tastes like you think a stew should taste. The summer one is a lighter flavor. Oh. Uh, Jody also said that her rosemary is doing great in her front window. So. Oh, wonderful. Then always keep it in your front window when, when you bring it in, because if it's working, it's working. A lot of the time they'll get um, that powdery mildew. And the best thing I've found for powdery, powdery mildew is to just spray them. You can put a bunch of different things in your sprayer, but just if you spray them with water with maybe a drop of vinegar or a drop of, of um, rubbing alcohol, I've had luck, somewhat success with both of those. Just a drop though, not much. But if it's working in the front window, stay with the front window because they're real touchy. Oh, I see Sue Mings is suggesting tarragon chicken for that tarragon question before. <laughs> oh good, Sue knows. <laughs> Um, okay, Kathy says, I keep getting tiny little bugs on my herbs around August that turn them yellow. Is there a natural repellent to keep them away? I don't know. Hmm. Tom, do you know? I, I don't get those. Um, what, you know, could you send an email to gardnersos at outagamey.org? Um, I'm not sure what those bugs might be, but there's there's a couple things. I need to know if it's indoors or outdoors. Yeah, that's actually good for all your questions after this session is Outagamey. Gardner SOS at Outagamey. What was it again, Tom? <laughs> Gardner SOS at Outagamey.org. Yes. If you have questions anytime, you can answer. And if you've got any questions about herbs, send them to that also, and I can forward them on to Jackie. 
All right, we have Steve ask, would Mexican saffron be added to the Mexican herb list? <laughs> he must be a fan. What was the question? Uh, he said, could Mexican saffron be added to the Mexican herb list? Sure. Um, sure, I've never I used it. I, so I, I, he probably has, but yeah. Okay, does celery seed come from lavage? I'm not sure what that means. Lavage? No, no, it's a total different plant. I think it might be in the same family, but I don't know. Lovage is, um, it's a real tall plant and it's got kind of a, a leaf that's shaped almost like a duck foot, but it's big and it's got big lobes on it. And that's, if you just take the leaf and you chop it up and, and use it, it tastes like celery, but it's, it's not in the celery family. It's actually stronger than celery. And it does, it's a, it is a perennial, even in Seymour. So, you, you know, once you get it, you'll have it. And I see somebody else is sharing something about tarragon. They said it is used to create a soda in Azerbaijan and Georgia. The country oh, often referred to as Georgian lemonade. And she said it's very good or eat it raw. Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, does celery seed, oh, yes, I asked that one already. Uh, let's see, what part of borage is edible? The flowers and the leaves too, but the leaves are kind of hairy. So the flowers are, are they the ones that taste like cucumbers? You can take those. I did once one year I took them and I was following one of the pretty books and I put them in ice cubes and then I put them in a um, in at Halloween I put them out in the, the punch and my sister was just horrified by them but I thought they were beautiful. So they, they're, they're uh, ornamental too but yeah you can eat them and they're very good. Just don't eat too many. Um, and Kim shared that Gardener SOS email in the chat if anyone needs to write it down. Um, let's see, Lisa asked, most herbs are able to be planted in the ground except the few you stated otherwise. So I think she's asking if most herbs can just be planted in the ground. Yes, and they all can be planted in the ground if you don't care about sh saving them. Like if you only want your rosemary for one year, plant it in the ground, it'll get bigger. Okay. Oh, another uh, tarragon is the secret ingredient in Kentucky Fried Chicken is coleslaw. Oh, I didn't know that either. See, <laughs> Who you did your favorites? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> um, does mint grow readily from seed? Well, you see, you see all of these mint seeds. I was taught way back when that a lot of mint is sterile and you can the, the original mint, I believe, was water mint, and it bred with something else and made peppermint, and then peppermint bred with something else and made spearmint. And with one side note, I should have probably said peppermint, we always say peppermint for the adult, spearmint for the child, because peppermint's way stronger than spearmint. So if you're working with kids, keep, keep to the spearmint or an apple mint. Apple mint is very mild and it's very tasty. But I if you can find someone with a mint, they would be very happy to share their mints with you. I almost guarantee it. So that would probably be your best bet. All right, great. That, oh, there is one more here. Does cooking nettles rid them of the spikes on the leaves? Yes, they do. If you dry nettle or cook it long, you don't want to just cook it for a minute. I mean, we need more than a blanch here. Um, I cook mine for 10 minutes or so or drying it that the sting goes out of it. It's completely good then because I, I make, I used to drink a lot more nettle tea than I do now and I should go back to it. But to drying dried nettles, I'd put in my, my um, pot and cook them away and then drink the tea. It's very good for you. But yeah, don't be afraid of it. Just picking it, be afraid of it. Because once it's, once it's cooked or dried, it doesn't sting. Oh, great. Um, that looks like all our questions. Jackie, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it was a wealth of information. It was so many ways to use herbs that I haven't thought of before. Um, and there is a, you did put the, um, the handout out there, right? Yes. The handout, the if, if the handout is available on the Outagamie County Master Gardener website, if you go to ocmga.net, and under education, there's a link to it there. Or if you email me, you're gonna have my email. Um, I can send it to you, the PDF to you. So 
um, if you need that. And it's like 30, it's 34 pages, I think. I think it's everything you yeah, talked about. Yeah, it's copies of the slides, a lot of the slides, because a lot of them had recipes or suggestions. And so I just put them on a PowerPoint, and I mean, on a PDF and put it, gave it to you. Okay, yes, yes. So um, let me know if you need that. Um, our next Master Gardener event is going to be in on April 3rd, the first Saturday of the month in Appleton, at the Appleton Library, well, on Zoom. That's going to be Aldo Leopold's um, Phenology. And then next month on the 26th, we'll be here with Kathy Baum talking about perennials. I think that'll be a great show. Um, thanks so much for being here, Jackie. I really enjoyed it. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, Tom, you have anything to add? Or uh, no, but if anybody wants, well, I do actually. Uh, the best place to get basil is at an oriental food store. Oh. Uh, it'll be a heck of a lot cheaper than getting it at one of the big box grocery stores. And you can also get kaffir lime leaves, which oh. are amazing. Aren't they good? It's just amazing. Oh, I love them. I just, I just had them the first time. I think it was last year or the year before. I was just amazed by them. And then the lemon leaf, too. I don't know if that's Asian. I think it is. But the lemon leaf, too, it tastes more like lemon than lemon does. Yeah. Wow. Wow. There's, great. there's also one on Law Street. There's an Asian grocery store there that is, is really interesting to say the least. Um, check it out. Yeah, that's a good tip. That's a great tip. Well, thank you all for being here and we hope we'll see you again. Um, that's it for now. Bye, everyone. Bye.